The most common cry I hear from people who want an energy efficient home is that their house is too small and they couldn't possibly have internal wall insulation. Now I understand that because I felt the same when we were approaching our retrofit. I thought there wouldn't be any room to move and I was imagining those horror movies and dreams where the walls start to close in on you. I was of course being immensely dramatic and it's nothing like that. Now the work is finished, the change is imperceptible in terms of space and we don't notice it anymore. So I'd really encourage you to leave it in there as an option because one of the benefits is that it enables you to go one room at a time if you need to without having to do all the external walls in one go. So when is the best time to put in internal wall insulation? Well, the most obvious one and I would please implore you not to lose this opportunity, is when you're doing any other work on the house. So if you're stripping back to put in a new kitchen or you're stripping back to do decorations or build an extension, the house is already in a mess. You're probably already back to the brick in lots of areas. Don't lose that opportunity. Add in insulation and air tightness as you're going along. It's very little extra work and very little extra cost. So that is the perfect opportunity. The other time is when you feel so blooming cold, you've got to do something and so you look at energy efficiency and then you can do your whole house in one go or you can go one room at a time. Another time is if you want to add value to your house. It's added an enormous amount of value to our house, so it's definitely worth doing. And the final and probably the most important timing is when you want to do something directly for the climate and for the grandchildren, because you will cut your carbon emissions by a shed load. So let's have a quick look at how this works. Air moves around your house all the time. Warm air rises and cold air sinks. So that's why it's really important to have your loft insulated, otherwise all the warmth you've so lovingly created is going to go out through the roof. But warm air will cool when it hits a cold surface, so you need warm surfaces all around you. You also need a thick barrier between inside and outside so that you can keep steady state. And this is what insulation does, it provides a warm surface and a warm thick barrier so that the heat will stay in the place that you've created it. If you've got your whole house insulated then the whole house will be warm. If you've just got one room then you need to make sure that's shut off from the cold parts of the house until you can get round to doing those. And I can tell you that it all works because in our house which is retrofitted I don't know what the weather's like outside I don't know whether it's going to be really cold when I go out and when it's really hot I don't know how hot it's going to be so the house stays at a steady state. So how do you know which insulation to use? Well the trick there is to understand U value. U value measures the amount of heat that will go through a given material. It's measured in watts per square metre Kelvin. Can't explain that to you I'm afraid. All you need to know is the lower the better. So to give you an indication, a single glazed window has a U value of 5.6, a new double glaze 1.2, a new triple glaze 0.6. We used 100 mil of wood fibre, that's got a U value of 0.3. And this is a really good one, it's hemp, and it's got a U value of 0.04, so that's amazing. So how to go about it? Well, the first point is you only need to do the external walls. So if you happen to live in a mid terrace, for example, you've only got to do the front and the back, which isn't at all onerous. Traditionally, terraced houses share heat between them. So it can be a real advantage not to insulate your internal walls. But there might be a good reason. My eldest grandson, for example, he's a drummer, so his family have certainly got some internal wall insulation because if you get the right one, it's brilliant for acoustics. The second point is that it's always better if you can go back to the brick. This means that you can check out the state of the actual wall itself. You can see any breaks in the brick, any air gaps, any areas of damp, and you can deal with those before they degrade your insulation. 
in old houses built before 1930 that are breathable, then this also means there's no risk of you having modern plaster, modern gypsum plaster, which isn't breathable. You can take that off and it won't cause interstitial condensation and you can replace the final plaster with lime. So how do you go about actually attaching the insulation to the wall? Well, there's two main ways and we've used both of them in our house. The first way we used was to for the, have the carpenter build a wooden framework. Now, wood's a really good insulator, so it's okay to have that alongside the insulation. So a framework and then the insulation is packed in. It's really good then using wood fibre because it's so flexible and if you cut it slightly bigger than the gap then you shove it in and it makes sure that you don't have any air gaps coming through. But to be absolutely sure about that of course you add an air tightness membrane. And I'll put a link to a video on air tightness to explain more about that. Once the wood fibre is packed into the wooden frame then you cover the whole thing with plasterboard and we used a wood fibre version of that which is tongue and groove and then over the top of that then you put lime plaster which uh, goes on exactly the same as other plaster these days. The other way to do it again back to the brick and then you need a smooth surface so we used something called diathonite. Now this is a thermal plaster and it can go on to any thickness so it can go up to 100 mil, or it can be just used as a skin, which is what we did in this case. They also make one that goes on external walls, but that's another subject. So we used a skim of diathonite, and on top of that put 80 mil of a rigid wood fiber, and that was glued to the diathonite with a breathable glue because our house is old. And then you could put lime plaster directly onto that. I'm often asked if there's any adaptations you have to make when you insulate internally and there are a couple that come to mind. If you live in an old house with a cornice around the join of your wall and your ceiling then that will have to be replaced. We had ours remade to match the original and I have to say it was the most expensive part of the process. The other place is around the windows because the reveal now, the depth between the actual window and the wall will be bigger so you have to have the architrave uh, re replaced but a carpenter can do that quite easily. The only other thing is you have a load of woolly jumpers you need to get rid of and you'll have to get used to paying lower energy bills. If you're thinking of having a builder help you do this work then remember they may not know that much about retrofit so it's important that you educate yourself. That's why I wrote the beginner's guide to eco-renovation. It's got all the detail that you need. You don't need to be an expert, you just need the basics so you can have a conversation with them. And one of the issues you'll need to talk about is the sort of insulation you want to use. Most builders will default to PIR, trade names Kingspan and Celotex. It's very efficient and it's easy to get hold of, but it's made from petrochemicals, so it's terrible for the climate and it off-gasses volatile organic compounds, VOCs, into your house. So if you want a healthy house, then it's much better to use sustainable insulation. I'll put a link to a video I've already done about insulation so you can see the different sorts that are available. So I hope that's been helpful. I hope that encourages you. If you've any questions at all, please put it in the comments and I'll do my very best to answer.